Hey everyone, greetings from Detroit. This is Todd Harden with Plastic Oceans International, and I'm super excited to once again be doing a one-on-one -on -one with Plastic Oceans, and this time with one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, her name is Sarah Ferguson. She's uh, She is a physiotherapist based in Durban, South Africa, uh, where she's also the founder of Breathe Ocean Conservation, and I would be remiss without also mentioning that she's also one of the world's greatest endurance open water swimmers. Um, and of course, a world record holder, a Guinness world record holder, um, as we are on about just past the one year mark where she became the first human being ever to swim around Easter Island in, in one go. Um, so she uh, is also experiencing something um, quite different that a lot of us are hearing about right now. She is a person dealing with the coronavirus. So it uh, should be an interesting conversation to get really truly an inside uh, perspective of someone who is directly dealing with this and has been now for, I think, well over a week to 10 days, if not a couple weeks. So with that, Sarah, welcome to this conversation. Thank you. How's it, Todd? Nice to see you from afar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy from, times from, that we live in. From too afar, but I guess that's our reality, whether we're, whether we're in uh, Durban, Detroit, or Detroit in Detroit. Right now, it's a social distancing thing, right? It's, it's yeah, kind of crazy. Yeah, for sure. A crazy time. Well, well, listen. It, as I said, you are you have tested positive for coronavirus, and you have been dealing with this now, if I recall, for at least well over a week and a half. Um, give us an idea of you know how are what does it mean for you? How have you been dealing with it, and how do you feel physically, emotionally, and uh, all the way around? Yeah, it's been a very interesting. This is day seventeen for me. Oh, wow. Um, so it's been a long, long journey. Um, I'm allowed to go for another test on Friday and they're actually not retesting to test if you're negative after two weeks, but because I'm a healthcare worker, I am going for a retest, um, which is good for my own mind as well. I need to know <laughs> that I'm better. Um, yeah, it's been a very interesting journey. I think the first day that I showed symptoms was the day that our president announced a big need for social distancing. Um, and that evening he said, if anyone's been traveling to a high risk country in the last three weeks, they need to put themselves forward. And then the next morning I actually woke up with a sore throat and a dry mouth and I was like, Oh, uh Oh, so I contacted my doctor and she, um, sent me straight for testing, um, and told me to stay at home and, and isolate myself while I waited for the results. And, um, it was quite a roller coaster of a week cause I, I kind of anticipated the results would be ready and. 48 to 72 hours. So I was ready for like Wednesday latest to know my, my status. Um, and the days just went on and on and on and I still didn't know. And I only got my diagnosis on the Saturday. So I had a whole five days of just waiting, um, thinking from that I wasn't positive to thinking if I am positive, I've been in touch with a lot of people in the last two weeks and as a healthcare professional, I've touched people, I've worked with people and the implications of that are quite big. And so I was very concerned for that kind of implication. Um, but then the other side of me was like, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like having hectic symptoms. It's just a mild throat. And yeah, so that week was tough. And then when I got the diagnosis, it was a bit like a big shock, really. Um, it was like, okay, so you're positive now. Now what? Like, what does that mean? What does that mean for the people that I've been in touch with? What does that mean for my house um for my health for everything because that whole week i'd still trained i felt mostly okay i did swimming in the sea um, with people i'd already been in contact with um i went i swam i left i did some home stuff and i felt fine so it was just um quite a shock and then um and then it was again a waiting day a waiting game to get contacted by the ncid um, to wait for them to see what they were going to say and it was I was like living in this fear that I had done something wrong and that I was a criminal and I was in trouble and I felt guilty I felt responsible for a whole lot of people I had people panicking and phoning and asking questions and I had a bit of um, negative repercussion from some of my colleagues at work which is understandable everyone's in fear and they, they're like what about my clients what about my business you've been in the center what does that mean um, and at the same time knowing that I couldn't have done anything different I didn't you know, it wasn't a big thing in South Africa when I came back from traveling. Um, no one had even mentioned it in the UK when I was there. So it wasn't like I did the wrong thing. It was just all these thoughts that come into your mind. So it was an emotional uh, roller coaster. And then physically as well, it was uh, fluctuating from feeling completely normal one day um, to the next day having a sore throat or a bit of a cough. And then I would do a little bit of exercise because I thought doing nothing makes you feel worse. So let me move. And then that would make me exhausted. So the last four days up until yesterday 
I've just been super, super tired, sleeping more than 10 hours a night, which is not normal for me. Um, <laughs> if I do anything mild, um, and that's mild by my standards, but even for most people, it's like half an hour Pilates, I would get a sore throat, I'd cough, I'd have to go and sleep, I'd get a headache. So like weird stuff like that. And um, now, now I've done nothing all day, so I'm very, very rested. But um, I still, if I do a little bit of high intensity stuff or even an hour of Pilates yesterday, I had a sore throat. So I'm taking it slowly, listening to my body and, and I'll be retested on Friday, which is good news. Um, and I'm trusting it'll be negative. But um, yeah, it's been an interesting journey for me physically and, and emotionally and mentally, just dealing with all the emotions of the implications and um, how that would affect other people, knowing that I'll be okay, but what, what about people who aren't as healthy as me, who aren't as young as me, who have a high risk that I've been in contact or indirect contact with. And luckily so far, everyone I have been in touch with who I know that had big symptoms and has been tested have come back negative. So that's a huge relief for Good. me. Um, so yeah, that's kind of been my... You, you had over two weeks. Days. You said 17 days, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And is that 17 days from the point of being diagnosed, testing positive, or just feeling kind of under the weather? 17 days from the first symptom. So from the 15th of March is when I had my first symptom, and then I was tested positive on the 21st. So it's been 10, 11 days since the, the diagnosis, but 17 since self-quarantine. Sure. And then South Africa's been in lockdown. This is day six for us. Um, so I'm a little bit ahead. I'm halfway. Woohoo for me. I've made it more than halfway. <laughs> Um, you know, if I, if I take a quick look here, what, give me an idea of, um, I'm bringing up basically the current, um, um, kind of counts here in South Africa. If I, I'm going to screen share here something with you and let me know if you're seeing that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, so I mean, this is, although, let's see, I probably haven't refreshed this in the last um, 20 minutes or so, so let's see if there's any change, but, you know, so we're up over, we're getting close to 900,000 total confirmed cases globally, we're at um, just over, what is it, 43,500 deaths worldwide. What's, what's, what's the current situation in South Africa? I think if I looked at that earlier here, you know, now I don't know how up to date this is, but this is saying about 1,300 confirmed cases, um, five. Yeah, that is, the, that is the current status that we have as well. Um, okay. It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, we're what, in day six of a 21 day lockdown to try and sort of flatten the curve and just to try and minimize the spread into the, into the townships, into the, you know, the masses. Right. Um, and we hoping and trusting that that's, that's going to do the job. Um, uh, it's it's a big a big step for South Africa, and I think our president has done really well at trying to catch this fast and do the right thing quickly. And hopefully, we haven't done the lockdown too late. Um, yeah. I know we've done it sooner than countries like a lot of parts of America and, and England, but um, it's it's still it's still too early to say. I think we we about to reach our peak in the next week or so, and then we'll have a better idea of how how severe it is in in South Africa. Um, but yeah. Well, we're getting indications here. I mean, we saw yesterday, uh, you know, Mr. Trump uh, had a, probably his most serious um, um, message yet. So that's, I think, a good thing to finally see, I think, a much more serious and honest, I, I think, uh, portrayal of what's happening here in the U.S. The next two weeks appear to be kind of a real, you know, tough spot for us coming up. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to just see how things going. I mean, like you, I kind of experienced the same thing in the sense of, I mean, thank God I'm not dealing with it. But for a few days, I had symptoms that I thought, well, maybe, you know, you, know, you think, is it in my head? Is it real? Is it just nothing? Is it just a typical cold or something? But, you know, worrying about other people. I live in a home where my parents, you know, live on a, a lower level apartment, um, sharing basically many spaces with me. And that's, you know, that was on my mind. You know, am I going to infect my parents or my, you know, my partner or whoever? So, um, you know, I know you had mentioned before that exact same thing was almost the guilt of who have I infected, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. I think I pointed out to you too, were an innocent kind of bystander, so to speak. Um, and you think you were infected in, um, pr probably in, in global travel, maybe to the UK. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the most likely scenario, but again, there's no way of actually knowing. And I mean, I got back on the 2nd of March, my symptoms came on the 13 days later. So 
it it fits within the time frame of, of the virus and showing symptoms but um it's so hard to tell and, and i think that's the, the tricky thing with this virus is like there's so much unknown about it like when are you infectious are you only infectious from when you have the symptoms um which it appears to be in my case because all the people that i have been in contact with prior to showing symptoms um have been tested negative so in a sense they haven't been affected by me but and i've been isolating some symptoms so um, and then my housemates, they, so far they're fine, which is amazing. Um, and then do I have a milder form of the virus that doesn't spread? Obviously we're trying to do the right thing. I'm wearing a mask when I got my room. Um, I don't eat, well, I eat with them, but they're cooking. I'm not touching the food, um, that kind of thing. We're trying to follow all the, the routine and the, and the hygiene. But uh, I think that's the tricky thing. And even, even with me being a healthy person, knowing that I trained when I had symptoms, what are the implications of that on me as an athlete long term? Is that going to affect my lungs? Am I going to spiral downward quickly because, you know, my doctor sent me a message one day saying, just so you know, I contacted the hospital and if you, you know, if things go badly, there's a face for you there. And I'm like, thanks, that's very encouraging. Um, so your mind does, you know, go fluctuate from being, it's all fine to worst case scenario. And, uh, Obviously, I've had a lot of time in my hands, so I've spent a lot of time writing and journaling and looking back at stuff over the past. And, and I found one of my posts from five years ago, um, I actually had bilharzia, which was undiagnosed for eight months. And the symptoms that I'm feeling now are very similar to, to then. So it was really interesting. I'm like, I've actually experienced all of this before. Um, it's just now this has a different name. Um, and at the time, we didn't know it was bilharzia. But... Um, it's just interesting seeing how your body responds. And I'm like, I'm pretty much going through exactly what I went through there. If I did too much, I would get a sore throat. I'd had a constant post-nasal. So um, whether the virus has also brought in a flare-up of the Bohazia is another question that hangs in the air. We don't know. Um, it's just crazy. <laughs> well, so you, you kind of said we've all had so much time on our hands now to either do things that we maybe haven't had an opportunity to do or just think about things, reevaluate things. You know, we often say rethink plastic in our world, but you know, what, what is it, what has the time allowed you to do? Is it kind of allowed you to rethink anything in your life and how we do things, whether it's you directly or us as a, as a global society? Um, I think for me personally, uh, not hugely changing in how, like my outlook on life and all of that. But I think um, I've seen it as a time where it's, it's forced rest. It's forced time for me to actually stop. Um, and process what's happened to me in the last year and a half because it's been a complete whirlwind since um, the swim around Easter Island with the swim against plastic um, and just the opportunities that have come from that have just been one after the other and they've been amazing things but I actually haven't been had any time to stop and process even that swim never mind all the things that have come from that so for me it's been a really good time to actually just stop and rest and process stuff and uh, that's been good for me um, and then, and then give me some space and time to, to be ready for what's next. Um, and whatever that looks like, it's going to be different for everyone and it's going to be different for the world, I think. Um, but from a, from a perspective of my own journey and, and with my advocacy for the ocean and the environment, um, I think that this virus is giving us all the time to, to stop and, and reevaluate how we live our lives and focus on the things that matter. And I think um, being a pretty optimistic person by nature, I, I see the positives of this as, as much as it sucks and there's huge economic um, impact for globally um, and health and finance for, for everyone, small businesses. I mean, I've got friends and myself included. If you don't work, you don't get paid. So it's, it's stressful. But um, using this time to really draw on my faith and trust in, in the bigger picture um, as well as reconnect. I mean, I've connected with long lost cousins that I haven't spoken to in years and old friends from India from my time there. And it's been really good just to reconnect with people and then connect even closer with the people that are meaning, you know, meaningful to me in my life. So um, in that sense, it's been, it's been positive, um, just giving yourself time and space. And I think it's an opportunity for all of us to just stop it. Our lives are so busy and frantic um, and we're just being forced to stop and rest and, and reconnect with ourselves and reconnect with what's important and, and what we want our life to look like going forward. So for me, I don't see my life changing significantly in my path and where I'm trying to trying to go. But again, who knows what the future holds and and what that looks like. But um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a good time, and I tend to find the positives rather than the negatives. 
Well, I think that's a good a good way to approach it. It's um, you know definitely a time to to reevaluate some things for sure. I think it's even been interesting to see the you know evidence of the planet taking a rest environmentally, and we see certain things like you know pollution over over parts of China or you know marine life showing up in places it hasn't been seen in in quite a long time. So it's amazing to, to take that look at what impact we as humans in this frenetic, you know, fanatic, um, a chaotic lifestyle and crazy lifestyle that most of us live, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think from a planet point of view, it's really good. Like it's allowing the planet to heal and, and as terrible as this virus is, it's actually been such a good thing for our planet and environmentally, like just it's what it what we needed because we are killing our planet and sure. it has unlocked a whole lot of other things with plastic and single use and all of that stuff, which I guess we'll, we'll discuss, but it's such a tricky thing. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's, essential. and I, I, you know, mentioned this as we were chatting a little bit before we started the interview was, you know, one of the things that's being discussed in kind of the plastic pollution world in our movement is, you know, part of the difficulty now in dealing with the messaging out there that, you know, it's the, it's, the anti-plastic movement's kind of taken a hit here because people have it in their mind that now single-use plastic is a better option. It's okay. Um, and I, to, to someone, I understand the psychology of someone going into a grocery store during this and seeing apples wrapped in plastic versus not. Whether that's going to protect them or not, the psychology behind it, I at least understand that. But I mean, what, what's your feeling on it? Yeah, I think... There's two two ways that you can look at it. I think from from one perspective, yes, maybe packaged goods are safer. Uh, that's debatable. I'm not convinced. Um, I think just slightly deterring from that, and I'll come back to that. Is just it's it's also forcing us to support local um, and support seasonal stuff, and I think that's really important going forward. But in terms of packaging and single use plastics, it's such a tricky one because plastic has actually saved lives, saving lives. I mean, they're using ventilators and face masks and gloves to stop the spread of it. And, and that is unfortunately what is required to save lives and prevent the spread of it. Um, and so we've got two, two senses of one, like we need to protect lives and, and that requires single use plastic, but we also need to try and look at growing our own fruit and vegetables. Use this time. If you've got a garden, plant your own stuff. Um, so I think there's still choices that we can make as individuals um, that are going to be more environmentally sustainable and friendly. Um, but I think that at the current moment, health and safety comes first, and we do need to sure. to make those choices accordingly. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Fully agree. Well, I mean, okay, so let's take a little bit of a pivot. Um, talking about plastic pollution and something, an effort that you and I were both involved with was to swim against plastic. Now, hard to believe it's been over a year now. It was a year ago, I believe March 16th was the day that you actually completed your, your, your world first swim. Is that correct? Was it the 16th? Yeah, somewhere around there. I can't yeah. remember. But yeah, I think you started on the 15th and finished on the 16th. And, um, you know, again, uh, Sarah was part of our, our Swim Against Plastic to raise awareness um, about plastic pollution, um, really through the landscape of Easter Island. Um, Sarah, Sarah came up with the idea uh, working with our team in Chile to, that she was going to swim around Easter Island in order to become the um, first person to do that, but use that as a way to raise awareness about plastic pollution there. So um, for those that aren't aware, Easter Island is in the South Pacific. It's one of the most remote places on the planet, yet its shores are awash in microplastics, larger scale plastics, etc. And it was a great backdrop for us to, to, to bring the issue to the forefront um, and, really, and really look at it from a small little microscopic location, but think about it globally. But here we are a year later. I mean, why don't you maybe uh, let us know, I mean, how do you feel a year later about the accomplishment and maybe what being on Easter Island and that experience meant to you? Um, sure. It's that experience of being on the island was, was incredible. Um, and I think for me, um, it's still the biggest achievement or accomplishment that came out of that swim was the team of people that came together as, as a united cause. And I think it's so fitting even for what we're combating now as a, as a global pandemic is that together we can stop this. Together we can, by social distancing and good hygiene and that kind of thing, we can stop the spread and we can beat this virus eventually. But um, and, and that's what we did on the island and essentially is a small, smaller scale of what we're trying to do as a global nation and global humanity in, in this virus. Um, 
So the island itself was incredibly special. The people were amazing. Um, I felt such deep connection so quickly with, with the team, that the locals that were involved, that we met, that were involved directly in the swim and indirectly. Um, and I definitely have a huge desire to go back and visit them and, and just see sure. um, how everyone's doing and, and just explore the island from, from not from the ocean, <laughs> from a different perspective, which I didn't really get to do, obviously, with the, the swim and the recovery afterwards and all of that stuff. But um, yeah, the swim itself, it was, it, it was still the toughest thing I've probably ever done, um, just from a salinity perspective. And it was a really, really tough, tough swim. Um, but it, uh, yeah, it, it definitely wasn't my favorite swim that I've done. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> and I'm showing some information here on screen. Sorry, just to interrupt you for one second, just so folks can see what we were yeah. talking about. I mean, this is 40 miles, 63 and a half kilometers. It took Sarah just over 19 hours um, nonstop in the water. Um, so just to put into perspective a little bit of what she's, you know, what she's talking about. I mean, here's some basic information here. So sorry, Sarah, go ahead and continue on. And um, I know you yeah. had some difficulties with the swim too, uh, towards the end in particular. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the two things that made it particularly hard um, and one by all accounts was the salt and the salinity. I've never experienced such salt water other than the Dead Sea in Israel. Um, it was awful. Like within half an hour, I was struggling with that salinity. It was almost like a chemical taste. I was taking chunks of Vaseline and coating my mouth. It was, it was terrible and it was really difficult to disassociate from that. And then I think the second thing that made it particularly tough is because of, of that, um, I was kind of prepared for everything else, like pain, jellyfish, blue bottles, seeing a shark, big waves, all of those things. But that salinity was something I couldn't, I couldn't fathom and I couldn't kind of escape. And then because it was um, often in the swims that I do that are long and, and very long marathon swims, there's long sessions of the swim that you can switch off and you kind of zone out and you're just in another world somewhere far away, you don't know where you are. Um, whereas for this swim, there wasn't one second that I was disassociated. Um, I had to actively try and disassociate. And the reason why I couldn't disassociate was the salinity, number one. And number two, because it was so choppy the whole time, there wasn't any kind of smooth, easy sailing. You could see the shore the whole time. You could see the waves crashing. The guys were concentrating hard just to keep me on the straight path. Um, it was very bumpy and rocky. Half the team got seasick, as you know, on the, on the boat. Um, I had to take a couple of valoids to, to prevent um, getting properly sick. And so that lack of disassociation and being fully present for 19 hours was also made it particularly hard. And then the knowledge that you're not going to see anything, that, that, that the water around the island is not full of life, unfortunately. There's no whales, there's no dolphins, there's no sharks, there's no things to get excited to maybe see. It's just like nothing and salt and water. And it was particularly hard because of that. So... I kept on wishing, oh, please, can I get stung again just to like distract me from something, like anything other than the salt taste. And it sounds crazy, but, you know, you use those distractions to, to help you focus on something different than what you currently sure, experience. Sure, and you're alluding to the jellyfish sting, so people know three times, at least three times, that you were stung by jellyfish with the swim, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, boy. I, I, I think we were, I was joking at one point, treading water, um, with some folks from your team just for 10 minutes and I was out of breath. So 19 hours, truly one of the most inspirational things I've been involved with, one of the most amazing experiences of my life. So I, I certainly thank you for completing your swim and really making it the ultimate magical experience out there. I mean, that was a team wow. effort. Yeah. Um, well, what's, what's, you know, obviously things have drastically changed, but I know you were planning some swims in the future, which may or may not happen, obviously, as they, as they, were planned and as you said you could have some medical um issues with lungs and stuff and, and hopefully that won't be the case but let's assume let's assume the world gets somewhat back to where we were and is there a, a swim in particular that you're interested in doing or what's next for you yeah there are lots uh <laughs> i'm still trying to find the next big one um but yeah i mean i'm supposed to we were supposed to swim around mauritius with the school in mauritius uh now in april um, in fact, like it was supposed to start on Friday, um, but that's obviously been postponed because of the, of the pandemic. What that looks like, we don't know. Um, that's with the school, so that's kind of a, a lower key thing for me, um, but it will still be an amazing experience. So looking this year to do a little bit more collaborative stuff with other, other swims that have been invited to participate in. There's still a swim that I want to do down the coast in, in South Africa. Um, it's also relatively short, but it's completely wild. 
um, in the trans sky that, that we're wanting to try and do um, if we can this year. Otherwise, it'll be put on hold again for next year. So um, this year, nothing like super, super big. Um, but I'm looking at options for, for the next year or two as another like really big event. Um, I've got my eye on a couple of places, but nothing, nothing specific yet. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to find some way that I'm where, where that's again just going to help increase increase awareness and spread the news more. Um, that's going to be challenging. Um, unfortunately, now I can swim anywhere in the world. It's going to highlight plastic because it's everywhere, um, and that was definitely shown quite clearly on Easter Island, being one of the most remote islands. So now it's about finding something that's unique and different that's going to show it in a different way, and and trying to include the local population. Um, in it as well. I think we learned a lot from the last swim and we learned from every swim we do how, how it looks and, and how to make it better um, and more impactful and more influential. But uh, yeah, we'll see. It all depends on, on funding and sponsors and time and what the world looks like um, after this exactly. after this exactly. pandemic. Well, we certainly hope to work with you again on, on something. Something I probably didn't mention, Sarah, is one of our global ambassadors here at Plastic Oceans International, but she's also uh, what I did mention, she is the founder of Breathe Ocean Conservation. And just a quick overview, give us an idea of what Breathe is all about. So Breathe is essentially about trying to eliminate throwaway um, plastic pollution, in, specifically in, in and around the ocean. And our focus is on, on trying to prevent it getting there in the first place. So um, beach cleanups, as great as they are, is is not the solution. We it's, it's inevitable, we have to do them, but it's trying to eliminate them from the source and trying to inspire people to think differently about their daily consumer habits in terms of refusing single-use plastics where possible um, and providing options and alternatives through partnerships with other companies and organizations to do that. Um, and our motto is to live deeply and tread lightly. So it's really just trying to, for me, inspire people to live their dream, follow their passion, but in the process of doing that to, to tread lightly on the earth and look at what that our daily choices make and the impact on the earth. And we do that a lot through, uh, my, my passion is predominantly through young kids um, because they have the future. So trying to get into schools and education and do motivational talks and workshops with schools. But um, as the founder, I also do quite a lot of corporate talks and workshops as well. And I'm getting a little bit more involved in that, um, which is a new challenge for me, um, but one that I'm enjoying. Um, yeah, so we're trying, uh, being our... A, a relatively small or very small nonprofit we're trying to kind of have our niche and our influence where we can in our strengths but collaborate with people like you guys plastic oceans plastic oceans chile um and a couple of local organizations and partnerships so that we can combine our strengths to get more effective change um, because i feel that that's that's the best way to to have a bigger impact sure sure um well, one thing too, I want to just I want to mention is you know, "Swimming Easter Island" is a book by John McCarthy, who's a member of your team, um, but is out now and available through our website, through John's website, at events that you are doing as well um, throughout the world. Um, it's a great short read, about I think about eighty or ninety pages that really chronicles Sarah's swim around Easter Island. So I would encourage everyone to go check that out. You can go to swimmingeasterisland.com. Um, which will basically take you to a page on our website with lots of great information. Here you kind of see the cover um, there. Um, also, breathe conservation, no, breatheconservation.org is the website, correct? Yeah. So yeah. go check that out, breatheconservation.org. Uh, we also have swimagainstplastic.com, where you'll find a link uh, to the Easter Island swim in particular, where you'll see lots of information about what Sarah and our, our team and her team accomplished uh, through that entire experience. So, um, you know, with that, I would kind of say maybe any closing uh, words of advice for those out there that uh, how to how to how do we all get through this coronavirus COVID-19 experience and in your mind as someone who is directly dealing with it? I think it's it's what everyone's saying. Stay home, stay safe. Um, but no, I think use this time to really try and get creative, refine your creative, creative, creativity. Um, have a look. Are you doing living the life that you want to live? Now is a chance that you can you can make changes. Um, I've had to be a bit creative just in terms of I'm a physio. My my job is hands on, but I can still teach my Pilates classes online. I did my first online consult today to a client, which was very weird. But um, it's it's looking at things differently and and getting a bit more creative. And even in terms of travel, do you really need to fly everywhere? Um, can we limit that now? We've, we've had to. And is that a way forward with the global warming and climate change? 
do we have to travel as much as we used to? Um, so just for people to just start just stop and think, embrace the time that you have at home. Um, it's tough, especially for people who, who don't have space, who don't have outdoor gardens, who are living in cold climates, where you're stuck in a flat with kids. It is tough. Um, but I guess it's just to get creative and, and, and bond and um, just try and embrace it while, while it's there because we, we're not necessarily ever going to have this time again. It's, it's a gift of time that we've been given where we're forced to stop and slow down. Um, so yeah, just try and stay, uh, my psychologist doesn't like the word positive. She says stay hopeful, um, look for hope. And um, because that's the thing that drives us as humans. And I think there is hope that the world can be better after this, that we can have a, a, a better environment. And we've been given this opportunity as a gift to, to relook at how we live our lives. So live deeply, tread lightly, um, reconnect with the people you love and focus on those relationships. Um, yeah, good luck. Yeah, no, well, well said. Very, very wise words there. Um, well, listen, she is Sarah Ferguson. She is, she is a, a Durbanite based in the Durban, South Africa, a, a Guinness World Record holder. Again, I would encourage you to go to swimagainstplastic.com. Go check out breatheconservation.org, uh, which is her nonprofit organization uh, based in Durban. Um, Sarah, thank you for the time. I know you're, you're exhausted in, in dealing with this, and so I, I really do appreciate these uh, probably 20 or 25 minutes or so that uh, we've had here. And I wish you the best and I can't wait to see you in person and give you a big hug when, when it's okay to do that. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Nice to All see right. you. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Okay. All right. Cheers. Bye. -bye. Bye.